Today we get to talk with Mr. John Higgins, one of the best known chefs in the world. He has been practicing his craft for over four decades. He was Queen Elizabeth's chef for some time and has worked at so many high profile restaurants it would be impossible to list them all. He spent many years and has just retired as the Director of Enterprises and Brand Ambassador for the Centre for Culinary Arts at George Brown College in Toronto, where he has travelled the world promoting the culinary arts. Thank you, Paul. Good uh, morning to you. How are you doing? Doing good. Hi, John. Doing. How are you? Fine. Doing well. John, I was wondering, uh, with your, your two decades at the Centre for Culinary Arts at George Brown College, is it even possible to estimate the number of chefs that have been trained under your supervision? Uh, that's a good, a very good question. Actually, to give you an idea of the size of the Center for Hospitality and Culinary Arts at GBC, um, culinary students, we have run about 1,800 a year. Uh, so it's a few. And then the management school is actually about 2,000 people as well. So it's busy. A busy place. I don't get to see every single one, but I get to spend time with an awful lot of them. I actually make, it's like for, I do what I do for a living. I do it because it's a hobby. I like doing what I do. It's fun. I don't do it for the money. And I went into education. Uh, sometimes what happens, chefs, uh, you know, people get an education. It's like uh, they want to give back. And sometimes, I mean, I'm just going to tell you the way it is. It's uh, a retirement home for chefs. You know, I went in there to make a difference. <laughs> And it drives me up the wall. You, you know, usually in an interview, you, you just some bring someone in and I drive human resources nuts. And so I say, thank you for coming in today, the whole thing. And just so you know, we're going to start it off. This is not a retirement home for chefs, just in case. And it's yeah. amazing you see the, the facial, uh, 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 you know, the expression. Way they're, they're sort of going out like, oh, wow. And you're just, you know, that, that's what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a job and, you know, something, it's no different than someone comes to your restroom, the students are coming to learn a craft, or yes. a part of a craft, and, uh, you know, if you go and see a bad movie, you're not going to be upset, you're not going to be back again. So it's important that we give the students every opportunity to be successful, and they also have the right to fail. I wanted to just go, go back a little bit here uh, with, uh, because Paul was saying, too many restaurants to mention, but I think we need to kind of mention uh, some of your background in part just to lead up to the question that I want to ask here. So you worked in England for the uh, the, the Crown there, uh, and, and you, is that where you began your career, John? No, I, I'll give you a quick uh, the quick sure. overview. So needless to say, I've got a Scottish accent, so I'm very much of a proud. I've got deep deep uh, Scottish roots, but I'm very very much of a, a proud Canadian uh, for sure. Um, I wanted to be a chef since I was about 10 years of age. I went to a beautiful big hotel called Glen Eagles Hotel. Any of the golfers are, are watching this, they know where Glen Eagles is. It's uh, held. Oh, uh, okay. The I understand. Shop. Yes. So my ambition was to there, and I got went to college, and I met a, a wonderful uh, gentleman, Mr. Hogan, and he was talking one Tuesday afternoon, and he was sort of saying, and he, was, he must have been 70. He was a trooper. I mean, this guy was a paratrooper. He was just he he was just like so impressionable uh, for a young guy like me and he told us when he worked at the central hotel in glasgow and he worked at turnberry hotel and he worked at Glen eagles when he worked at buckingham palace when he worked in uh, uh jamaica he worked at all these places and i just says to him says to myself johnny boy that's what you're doing and that was it so uh, needless to say i uh finished my college uh passed all the exams etc got a job at the central hotel in glasgow and my ambition in life was to work at Glen Eagles Hotel. That was me. That was my ambition. Uh, this was like a beautiful hotel, middle of nowhere, almost like a Bam Springs type thing in Canada. So the, yes. the, the audience can understand the, the magnitude of this place. It just stands there. It's like, it's, it's like, it's like going to, if, if, if I go to heaven and the pearly gates are there, it's going to be beside Glen Eagles Hotel, the, the, one of the, the, the golf courses. Uh, so that, that's my recollection. So that was my ambition and drive. So I got to Glen Eagles when I was 19. Uh, which was fast, and then after that, I uh, I thought next step, uh, John, you're going to uh, Buckingham Palace. So I kept on writing about 11, 12 times, and I'm a great believer. If you don't ask, you don't get, and to ask is good, but if you don't get, you keep on asking. So I eventually got a letter back from Buckingham Palace, and they asked me to go for an interview. Went to London, got the interview, got the job, 
and was there for two years. And I got to travel. Uh, you know, I went to Windsor every couple of weekends. I got to Balmoral. I went to uh, Sandringham. I went to Holyrood. I went on the Royal Yacht. So I got to see the inner sanctum of the palace and the life. And then uh, my mother, when I was about 12 or 13, got this beautiful postcard of um, of Canada. And there was this beautiful blue sky and these trees. I mean, it was, it was fall. Now I know it was fall. These beautiful red colors and blue sky. And I said, I'm going to go there one day. So needless to say, I got to Buckingham Palace. Before I got to Buckingham Palace, I thought, I'm going to go to Buckingham Palace. Then I'm going to go to Canada. And I think everyone thought I was like on Wacky Backy before Wacky Backy became illegal and you get every street corner across the country now. Uh, so that's where it was. So I, uh, I got to the palace and then Four Seasons brought me over through a connection that I made to, uh, to Toronto, up to the Four Seasons and in the park. Uh, which is no longer there. They've, they've torn it down and they've made other hotels, a uh, new uh, complex. But then uh, I was there for the first night and I uh, found out there was another Four Seasons Hotel downtown. And I asked everyone, what's the difference? Because I never, and all I knew I was coming to Canada and it was a terror. That was it. That's all I knew. Right. So I, they told me it's a better, you know, it's a real, it's a business hotel and it's a little bit different. So I thought, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to go there. Then I found out there was a Four Seasons in Washington, D.C. Uh, that Mr. Sharp is Dory Sharp, who was the, the, the president of Four Seasons. He would send his sons there for training. And then I thought, I'm going to go there. And uh, I actually said I was going to be the chef at the King Edward Hotel of the Four Seasons by the time I was 30. And everyone just laughed, you know, and, and I got the usual thing is, oh, you're Scottish, you guys can't cook, and this and that. And the sad right. thing about it was put a fire in my belly. There was no Canadian real sous chefs. There was no Canadian chefs in the city. And I just like, What's going on here? This is like prehistoric. You know, like this is Canada. There should be Canadian chefs. And there was no females either in the kitchen. I was like, I mean, no, there was a lot in Europe at the time. So I uh, I was very fortunate. I got transferred to Yorkville, four seasons after a year, exactly. And then I get eventually I was there for two years and I get transferred to Washington, D.C. Uh, to work there and I come back to Toronto. And I worked at a boutique hotel with all the movie stars. It was called the Sutton Place at the time. I got to meet... Heroes of mine, uh, you know, when I was a kid, Dick Van Dyke, I mean, Al Pacino, Burt Reynolds, so many people, you know, famous people. Uh, uh, the, the, they played the piano. Dust, uh, oh, who's the English guy who plays the piano? No, Dustin, uh, he was a movie actor. Um, can you think yes, of a, a very short man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I know who you mean. And yes. I can't think of the guy. He was anyway, in that he's, movie. He's not with... a movie, not that thing. Oh, Derek. I mean, yeah, yeah. So I met all these people. And then uh, needless to say, the, the job went, I was, I was 28. There was a job at the King Edward, which I wanted to be. That was the only place I wanted to be the chef in the, the four seasons. And needless to say, by the time I was 29, I was the executive chef at the King Edward. And I was there for 14 years. And then uh, after the, the, the Mr. Hogan, when I was a kid, uh, when I was at uh, college in Mullerwell in Scotland, uh, an opportunity came up at George Brown. And uh, I took the opportunity and... Uh, I've been here for 21, 21 years at the end of uh, this year. And just now I'm doing I'm some consulting. So I'm the, I'm, uh, my title just now at the present time is um, uh, Center of Hospitality and Culinary Arts Brand Ambassador. So, so that's, that's in a nutshell. That's, that's what I kind of wanted to get out there because you're an extraordinary guy. You, you had an extraordinary career. And I read one of the articles about you where you'd, you'd mentioned your goal. I'm going to be at Buckingham and I'm, I'm going to be head chef there. So the question I wanted to ask was, lots of people have goals, John. Uh, they're, they're, the goals are a dime a dozen. But you seem to be the kind of guy who has set extraordinary goals and achieved them. What sets you apart, do you think, from other people who started off with some of the similar goals but didn't? didn't get there. I mean, one of the things you mentioned is you're just persistent. You just kept kept yeah. uh, 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 reaching out. But what else contributed to that? It's, it's a very, very it's a good, it's a good question. I mean, there's a million ways to answer it. But to be honest, as my parents always say, you know, like, uh, you know, just be, be perseverant and believe and you have to, you can do something, believe in yourself. And I was surrounded by good people when I was a kid. And even at high school, I mean, I went, I went to a fancy, fancy high school. But the headmaster, Mr. Uh, Mr. O'Keefe, he says, you know, from this school, there's been doctors and lawyers and teachers and headmasters and the whole thing. And believe in yourself, it's positive, positive, I mean, it's positive energy. Uh, and I just believe that, you know, 
if you want something, you have to dream. You have to want it so badly uh, that it comes true. And I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I came to Canada at first, uh, I found out was, I was a great, comp I used to love competitions. And then I found out there was a, a Canadian national culinary team. And I just knew one day I wanted to be in the Canadian national culinary team. And I wanted to win. I wanted to win med gold medals. And my wife laughs at me. And I've got no, I mean, if I go to a competition, I don't want to come second. I may as well come 100. It's either first or nothing. And it's not about winning the, 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 the well, it is about winning the medal. But it's not about beating other people. It's about myself versus myself sort of thing. So you push yourself. Yeah. And I just believe in life. And I tell, uh, I, I try to inform students and coach people that, uh, and we have another program with people with mental health and addiction at George Brown. And uh, you have to believe in what you you do, and you have to, you know, you work hard. It's not, it's, nothing's going to come easy, but if you don't try, and uh, I just uh, said a couple of weeks ago, someone they done an interview, you know, if you uh, you reach for the sky, uh, you reach for the moon, I should say, and you get to the clouds, it's one hell of a long way off the ground. So it's, it's just being positive and thinking that you can do something, and especially when people say you can't do it. So maybe it's a stubbornness, It's maybe it's a Scottish thing I was born with but you know my parents for instance when I was born I was born with uh, uh, the doctor told me my mother would never walk in my life because I had uh, basically club foot my feet were totally imperfect I think and needless to say I can walk with today the whole thing only because my mother believed in it uh, and that sort of a you know uh, that, that was her belief right so she 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 was you know she's very spiritual as well in a lot of ways uh, but that's just that sort of thing maybe I got it from my mother that you know, you really need to believe in something to, for it to come true. So that, that that's my life, and I just I get through things like that, and it's do that's you, how I think I've, I've been so successful. Do you have, um, when you look back, what sort of things do you think that you had to sacrifice that um, uh, that, that helped you achieve the goal, but there's some perhaps some regret there? Uh, sacrifice going to rock concerts. I used to love really heavy music. I was into Black Sabbath and. I'd seen ACDC in Glasgow and an audience of 300 people before they were famous. Uh, I used to have long hair. I don't, I don't have any hair up top, that thing. Like it's, it's a maturity thing. It's not an age thing. It's just maturity. It's like a good cheese, right, guys? Uh, we, all, we all get through that. What, You're a little bit what, further what, along. Than the including cheese. us in that, Paul. You're a little yeah. bit far, further along the, the cheese route than I am. But, uh, yeah. you know, it, that, was, that was difficult. You know, your friends. But I remember when I went to the Central Hotel and the, 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 the manager who interviewed me, you know, he says, uh, you know, you give a lot of social time up and you'll give a lot of things that you won't get to. But when you're off, you'll make good use of the time. So I, I can tell you that, uh, John and Paul, that when I was, um, when I was off, I, I made good, good use of getting things. I mean, the others, like, I mean, there was maybe some, some weddings, not them all, that I would like to have gone to. I would love to have gone to maybe a vacation here or there, but, you know, I've been so fortunate. On the other hand, I've, you know, when I think about it, I've danced with the Queen. I've, I, I had cocktails and lunch with Jackie Stewart, sitting down and talking to him at Formula One car races. Is that right? You know, and the amount of people I have met, uh, and, you know, I stayed at the, the through a competition I won, uh, I stayed at the Baroness Rochelle, the Mout uh, Chateau Mouton in France, uh, uh, I mean, I've been to so many different places all over the world. I mean, I've, the only place I've been to is Australia, but I love what I do and it's a passion for it. But yeah, there's a lot of things I gave up. Uh, you know, like my wife uh, for 17 years, she laughed. I was, her family thought I was a, a figment of her imagination because I was always working. But you know, something I enjoyed it and I wouldn't have done it for that. And it's not about making money. Um, it's just enjoying something. You know, you have to get paid, right? But uh, like everyone. But at the same time, as i done it because I, I, it inspired me. I enjoyed it. I liked people. And I like to see my team. And it wasn't just about me. It was maybe uh, the way it's just now. But it's not about me. It's, I just got so excited and so turned on with, with uh, seeing people being successful. You know, if, if you take someone who is green and you can just, I can smell, I can just meet someone. So I say, they're going to be successful. You know, they'll just get. You know, when someone gets, I was just saying yesterday to someone, when someone walks into a room for an ad, uh, for a, an interview, or you meet someone, or a chef for the first time, or someone else, it's like, they have a presence. People have got a presence. Right. And, you know, you can learn how to do things, but if they've got not that, you have to be humble. 
uh, and you have to be thoughtful uh, and you have to be gracious and you have to be your two feet in the ground. That's one thing being Scottish and coming from outside of Glasgow. Trust me, you don't get your, your feet never get above the ground because that's what people would tell you. Like, you know, come on, be real here. You're, you're from Bell so you know, don't, don't dream that thing. So it's again, it's, it's just to see people being successful. That's the biggest thrill I get in my life. It's not about me, it's about see, seeing other people and then, you know, like doing competitions is encouraging. Yeah, it's, it's good for me because it's, it's mentally, it's good. It's, it's, it's pushing myself to be better. But if I can encourage one person to do it, or five people to do it, or ten people to do it, to make themselves better, it makes it makes everything much much better, and it's uh, much reward, much uh, very uh, rewarding for everyone, not just just including myself. John, uh, in Rosanna Kara's uh, 2019 article about you, she she talks about, uh, or you talk about influencing tomorrow's cooks and chefs. I'll quote here, while helping to pave the road for culinary change, unquote. I'm just wondering, has that change happened? And what were the changes that you were looking for? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's just to, to first of all, uh, you know, when you get through life and, 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 you know, sometimes in the kitchens, it was tough. People would yell and scream and, you know, for, for all different reasons. Uh, you know, and when I came to Canada, give me an example. Let, let's talk uh, Canada. I was only here and... Uh, all the chefs, they were all, they're all European. And I was sort of, I looked down my nose because I was Scottish, which put a fire in my belly. And I remember when I was, like I said, I couldn't figure out why there's no Canadian chefs. And then I couldn't figure out why there was no female chefs. Not that there was a lot in the UK, but I thought, and I took all these things in mentally. So and I thought, when I have the opportunity to be executive chef, I'm going to change this. This is going to be my time and to make a difference. And, you know, you have to walk the talk. And uh, the first thing I'd done uh, when I was at the King Edward, the first person I hired was a female chef, a lady called Lottie Anderson. Uh, very, very successful. And then I had another four uh, female chefs in the UK. They're all great cooks. And they pushed the guys. And when they push the guys, the guys get better without knowing it themselves. Right. So, so, so how, do you, how do you float that boat uh, without people, you know, so they, they come on uh, much more sort of gradually. So that was, that was a lot of my thing is, is how do you make things better? How do you make the food better? Uh, you know, how do you buy from a local supplier? Uh, and then getting your, you get your staff uh, to, to think of things through a different, you know, the world is not always round. It could be square, it could be rectangle. It's how do you see something, you know, a piece of, a hamburger is a hamburger. It, it, it could become a bolognese sauce. It could become a chili. It could become, whatever you want it to be it's just like you know there's always opportunities and a thing to look through uh definitely but at the end of the day as well it was to get uh, the staff also to think of financial uh restraints because sometimes you can you can be a great chef you can create great meals you can buy expensive foods but the thing is are you able to pay the rent pay the wages and keep yeah. the lights on and keep the door open so it's that business thing so i've, I've worked on that an awful lot and I've seen a lot of the, my staff uh, that have worked with me over the years to be much more uh, responsible for that, uh, understand it, and then also uh, be pleasant and be humble and be kind to other people and train your staff. Don't just, you know, train them for one job. It's not a, a one-trick pony, uh, Paul. It's like, you know, let them do everything you can do. Give them, empower them, you know, because the better they are, the better you're going to be, and then you don't have to work as hard either. What's the most difficult thing to teach them? Ah, oh, there's a lot of things that's, that's difficult. I mean, I think the thing is attitude. You can't, if someone doesn't have a great attitude, it's, it's very difficult, but you can yeah. demonstrate, you can model the way, uh, John. So yeah. the, I mean, that's one of my things is like, you know, every day in the kitchen, at the, the King Edward, for instance, uh, I used to, not because I wanted, not because I was just doing it for the sake of doing it, but I used to, the first thing I'd do, walk into the kitchen, I'd go right to the pot washer and I'd shake his hand. And, you know, you just shake hands, hi, good morning, good evening. Just like, I look as if it was, you know, if someone comes to my house, what would I do? I wouldn't just say, hi, how are you doing? You know, shake their hands. You know, I'm not a huggy person, but, you know, people yeah. know me over the years to become a lot more huggy than I was, ever was before. Uh, but I'd go to the pot washer just to say hi, because he was the most important person in the kitchen. And it's very simple. Here's, here's the logic. No pot washer. No clean pots, no clean no. pots, no food in the pots, no food in the pots, no food in the plate, no food in the plate, unhappy customer, unhappy customer, 
No money comes in for revenue. No money comes in for revenue. No You're paycheck. out of business. John has no paycheck. John stays home. John yeah. wants to play golf. Can't go and play golf. John has to stay home with a wife. Get the honey to-do list. Trust me. You make sure those children. So it gave me an opportunity every day to see how it was. And plus, you go to the pot washer, you see the amount of pots. How busy is the pot washer? What's the tempo? And you can look in, you use your eyes and your, your senses uh, to see how busy is it? Is he stressed out? If he's stressed out with the business today, how is everyone else doing? Mm -hmm. So it was always a good barometer for me. Is And that's what I mean, modeling the way. Uh, I read an article where uh, Ms. Anderson, you, who you referred to a little bit earlier, yeah. Was uh, uh, was interviewed, and I think that was the first thing out of her mouth. John was that you, John, models the the uh, uh, the role that it, it, it's it's uh, you don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk on all the levels you've just described. So uh, yeah, that that's not I I, I I realize that's just how you described it, but th that's also what others see you as. Yeah, no. It's so I try, I try to do that, you know, as much as possible. I mean, you know, there's going to be bad days as well. Like, you know, it was perfect all the time, but no fun, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's just trying to, you know, trying to make it make it better and, and you know, and, and just trying to see how can, I mean, how can I hire someone and then give them, I mean, it's like, it's been great at George Brown. I mean, there's some students that have come and uh, they've, they've gone on and done great things and, and you know, they're very, uh, you know, thoughtful at the end of the day. I mean, there's one young student that came in, uh, a good few years ago, I mean, 10, 12 years ago, once they come to George Brown, he came to George Brown, we got him an apprentice, he went to work with a friend of mine who was a, also an apprentice of mine, and now he's like, he's got a, through hard work and determination, he's got a Michelin star restaurant in Hong Kong. Oh, is that right? You know, and then there's another, another, uh, another uh, uh, former uh, staff member, uh, a gentleman called Jason Bangara, who is now at a place in Toronto called, uh, just outside of Toronto in uh, Cambridge called LinkedIn Hall, one of the best uh, hospitality uh, establishments in Canada and one of the best restaurants in Canada. And he came to work with me and he, he kept on bugging me. Uh, can I come and work for you, chef? And I kind of got enough like, I get no jobs for him. So I just brought him in for a coffee to see what he was like. And we chatted and I, said, and I thought maybe next week, I said, maybe I'll try and make something for this guy. And he was going to George Brown at the time. So I said, okay. I says, I'll tell you what we'll do. I says, Jason, I've got something for you. Yeah, yeah, anything. So I says, okay, it's working in the cafeteria. You're going to serve the staff food. You're going to cook some of the staff food. You're going to mop the floor. You're going to clean up the dishes. You're going to wash the dishes. And that will be your start. And we'll see how it goes after that. He came. He was like a kid over a chocolate bar. Every day be there. And then I used to do these tables in the kitchen. I'd cook for VVIP guests. And then this would have been 1992, 1994. I was charging $250 a person just for food. So it was high, high end. Right. Uh, and Jason used to come after he'd done his stint in the cafeteria and come up and help me uh, doing the food. So he worked right beside me. And then he left and we got my job in the UK uh, through another chef I knew. And then he was very, very successful. And he's been one of the most successful chefs in Canada. But the same thing, you know, we, we, we talked to each other and, 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 you know, it's just great. And just put a cookbook out there. Uh, and it's just great to see people being successful. And at some point, your your uh, your students, they're going to get international offers, aren't they? There's for the top chefs. There's going to be a lot of of uh, travel to different countries involved. I imagine they get offers from all over the world. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I mean, for instance, Paul, uh, we uh, I mean again, you have to believe in, believe in things. And it was uh, there was a chef, a very very famous Italian chef, just now. And he's been, you know, his name is Massimo Batura. He's got the, he's got a restaurant, a three-star Michelin restaurant in Modena in Italy. Number one, you know, he's, everyone talks about the guy. He was the best chef in the world for two or three years in a row. I mean, high, high, high end. So I thought we'd bring him to George Brown. Because uh, I thought, you know, we'll bring him to George Brown, help our Italian program. So to cut a long story short, I had 15 minutes uh, through a friend, uh, through a university we work with in, in Italy uh, called Alma near Parma. They got me 15 minutes to see Massimo Batura. So myself and I took Dario Domicelli, who works with me at the college, the Italian teacher. So we flew to uh, Milan. We went down to um, Modena, 15 minutes for Batura, trying to explain them what we'd like them to do, you know, why you should come to Canada, why you come to George Brown and the whole thing. This is like, 
I mean, this guy's a god. I mean, this is like a major rock star. This is like red carpet material for Hollywood. This is like uh, the thing. And so, you know, and I just believe like you sit there and you talk to him. So after about eight, 10 minutes, I said, well, why should I come? So I, we struck a chord and I, I won't go into it because it'll be too long about balsamic vinegar. Anyway, the next thing, two and a half hours later, he's apologizing to me because he can't get me into his restaurant. And he says, and, he's, and, he, and then he says, how, how long do you want me to come? So I says, well, I'd like to come for four or five days. And his assistant says, no, no, maybe you can go for a day or two days and then do a New York or something else. But he came for five days. Wow. And through that, we uh, he, he he does a competition in Italy for his uh, student, for uh, all uh, the colleges. And there's like 12 people get to this final. And whoever wins gets a stage to, or, a, or a, a placement with them for you know three or four or five months at the restaurant. Anyway, so he says to me, he says, here's the book, here's this book. Why don't you get some of the students from the Italian program to come up with an idea and we'll do a stage? And I'm thinking, the opportunity for a Canadian student and George Brown in the Italian program to go and work with Massimo Batura. I mean, what, a, what, a, what an opportunity. Anyway, so we sent uh, Alan, uh, he came to Toronto. We'd done the whole thing. He'd done a little cooking competition. He picked Alan. It wasn't necessarily the best dish, but there was, there, was, there was a lot of things about the characteristic of the individual that he liked. Uh, so Alan went to him and he was going to go there for uh, four months. So Massimo phoned me up about two and a half months into it. John, how can I keep this guy? I want to keep him. So that was oh, six years ago. Alan is Alan was a, you know just he was just a you know a cook in the kitchen. Now he's one of Massimo's sous chefs, one of the best jobs in the world. <laughs> and it's but it's it's just not about that. It's about my, my, the other thing is that you get that spectrum of three star Michelin best chef in the world. I'm as happy if someone goes to work in a hamburger st hamburger store or a, or a greasy spoon. It's about getting a job, giving someone the skill sets, the confidence to get to get a job, to be unemployed, to be employed, that they can be part of society. So it's not necessarily it's all about the being fancy. I mean, if someone works in a a, a retirement home uh, for seniors, that's good because the food should be good, and it takes the same amount of time to do a fancy meal as it does to do a simple meal, if not harder. You know, it's like, you know, if I was to go to a retirement home, I don't want to eat baby food. I want to eat some food that's, that's tasty. Right. So it's that sort of stuff. It's like, there's all different levels. It's like, uh, it's like puff pastry. You know, there's a million, there's a thousand, hundred thousand layers. Yeah. But it's, what layer does that suit that person? Because if we would all want to be NHL hockey players, there's only what, I mean, 20 teams, there's say 20 in a team. Yeah. So there's not a lot. I and mean, then you think of many uh, kids, uh, Male and female want to play hockey across Canada, so it's it's always interesting. But you know, for me, it's it's not where where they end up. It doesn't have to be five star, as long as they, they can make muffins. It's immaterial. But all I want to do is to make sure they have the skill sets to be successful from the the, the opportunity that they want to do. John, in, in I'm trying to think how to phrase this. Um, like as a consumer, somebody who would sit down to a to a meal, uh, particularly a meal at a, a very good restaurant, uh, they what they serve is usually is usually as uh, uh, as, as pleasing to the eye as it is the palate. And to make that distinction here for my question, because um, I, I I know that I can look at it and appreciate it uh, equally to to most people, but taste. Um, you remember, you know, when we were kids televisions had didn't have very good resolution and now they're super crisp um so usually using that as a metaphor do, is your palette 4k and that contributes to your success whereas maybe other people's it, it may not appreciate some of the nuances yeah i mean as the uh, kind of phrase a good few years ago when i was there i was a judge in chop canada and fit network and it was a kind of phrase uh taste is Taste is great. No, taste is, taste is, is, taste is king, even for the queen. And it's all about taste. You know, it's like, yes. you know, if you're having scrambled eggs, it's all about the taste of scrambled eggs. It's all about how the, that memory, you're, you're selling memories. You know, it's like if you, if, if to, to, today, this afternoon, you get down the street and you get a ham and cheese sandwich. Is it a good ham and cheese sandwich? What makes the difference? Is it good ham? Is it processed ham? What you like is, is your, your brain works as well. It's, you know, it's like, you know, you, 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 
you 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 think about things in different ways. So I think for me, I, I look at for for taste. It has to taste good. It has to look good as well. You know, it has to be there. But it's flavor. It's like, do these combinations work? I mean, you'll see a lot of restaurants sometimes today. I was speaking to a a, a teacher. I went to visit another college yesterday. We used to see the restaurant to see what they were doing. And sometimes people will put the wackiest flavors on, but they don't always work. And it's mm -hmm. shock value. Yes. It's like, you know, why are we doing this? But, you know, if you think uh, uh, you think of something, I mean, usually the question I ask every chef, and I'm sure I'll ask the same to yourselves. Today is your last, last day on earth. And tonight you're going to have your last meal on earth. What are you going to have for dinner tonight? Mac and cheese, no. Right? Paul, uh, John? You know, the others, it, it's usually, a, you. Th I would think a lot of people think of comfort foods. And uh, um, and depending on how you grew up and what the family budget was, it may not be the fanciest dish. So Paul said mac and cheese. I was just thinking bread pudding. Right. So it's so simple. I, I asked every chef I meet, Alan Ducasse. Alan Ducasse must have, I don't know, 23, 20 Michelin stars on all his restaurants globally. I says to Alan Ducasse when he was in Toronto, he was one of our guests. I, he says, chef, I says, last meal on earth, what are you going to have? A petit rouge, a small, uh, so like a small red fish from the Mediterranean, just sauteed with some butter and a glass of Merceau, a glass of wine. That's it. And he says to me, what are you going to have? I says, fish and chips in a place called uh, Saltcoats in the west coast of Scotland. And we had a half an hour conversation about flipping fish and chips. And it's not easy to do, you know, it's like it's, you know, it's the fish, the chips. Oh, the yes. Oil, the I mean, and then you think of this fancy, fancy, fancy food, lobster and caviar and foie gras. I mean, a monkey can take a piece of foie gras, put it in a pan, turn it twice and put a sauce on it. That's easy. But it's food is with memories. And, and you have to hit the sensations of the individual, what they're looking for. And it's that's what makes it even even better. So I think sometimes as a chef, I have to look at the customer and sort of say, what is he or she looking for? Are they looking for some simplicity? What 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 you know what where, where, what demographics do they come from? Are they looking for something that's a little bit new and modern? Am I, are you only going too far? So again, is you have to gauge the customers because if you can gauge the customers that are going to be coming to your restaurant or your your hotel or your motel or what it's going to be. You've got much more greater, greater chance for success. So, for instance, I say this to students all the time, and I've done this last week, and I'm doing a tour on uh, Thursday next week. And usually, this will give an example. Last uh, two weeks ago, I had a tour of uh, high school students. There was about forty of them. So, I in an auditorium, talking about food and the different things, and we gave them all a cookie to start with, and just you know, simple hospitality. And I say to them, "Does anyone any got a part-time job?" Any couple of them put their hands up. It's just a check, you know, break, a nice breaker type thing. I says, does anyone work at McDonald's? And they all start laughing, right? And then the one, one kid, and he put his hand up and put his hand down, right? And I thought, he's embarrassed. So I says, does that, I says, well, he's not only talking to McDonald's. I says, I think you work, you work at McDonald's? And he says, yes. And I says, oh, good. I says, well, you know something? There's only, there's 40 people here. The only person I'm going to hire right now, right this now, is you. I says, and there were everyone was you know, like, I'm Chef's McDonald's. I says, okay. I says, what does McDonald's teach you? You have to come in time. You have to come with a, uh, you have to come in time. You're going to be clean. You're, you're, you're going to be, you're, you're, you're facial. You're going to be presentable. You're going to have a uniform. You're going to have to work with other people. You may not like them all. You're going to have to work fast. You're going to have to work in a system. You're going to have to, be consistent as to the standards. I says, and whether you're making a hamburger, whether you're making, I says, if I go anywhere in the world, I says, you get some French fries, you get a cup of coffee, you get a clean washroom, you get some some sort of bread, you get some gunk in the center, and you maybe have some sort of beef. It's the same. They do it every part, every, <clears throat> every country in the world. They sell millions and millions of these every day. You know how it is to make a good hamburger on your barbecue? I says, so why I would hire this individual here is very simple because he, uh, has all those characteristics. He gets to work in time. He's he, he's been. He comes with a clean uniform, and his uniform is clean. He's been working with people. He can work with uh, under pressure. 
Uh, so it was always simple things. It's not just necessarily about someone else. And they were all shocked. And it was funny. I gave, I gave the young gentleman a, a, a gift certificate to come to the chef's house restaurant as a thank you for putting his hand up. And it's, you know, you have to reward people. It's surprise and delight, as I call it. And I think it's important that people, you know, don't look at food, you know, like a fast food places. You know, it's, it's garbage. Yeah, I mean, maybe the food is not good, which is possible. But, you know, what else are you learning? What, what, um, yes. What skill sets can you take that you can okay, use to tell? You yeah. know, so it's it's no different. You know, like that, that's right. my philosophy and a lot of stuff there. Is just, what what is yeah. what what skill sets can be transported to something else? That remind that, that that kind of leads it to my next question, uh, which may not have an answer. But in your forty year career, uh, whether you were hiring for the the the, the restaurants or with the students in uh, your your teaching career, have you noticed any difference in the caliber? of student in that 40 year period? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in today's world, there's uh, much more, uh, I wouldn't say pushback, but there's much more, some people don't know what they want to be. Uh, everyone wants to be a, a, you know, instant success. Yeah. I want it today, I want it for today, instead of something you know, like, you know, it's like playing, yes. I've been playing golf since I was 13 or 12. Sometimes I play crappy golf, but I have to practice. But everyone today wants to be a great golfer. They want to watch the, the television on a Sunday. And that's including adults. They want to watch the TV on a Sunday. And they want to be as good a golfer without putting the hard work in. So I think there's a little bit of that. And that doesn't sound like old or, you know, like I'm getting, you know, it's always better from before. But, you know, you have to respect. You wonder, yes. You have to respect the, the tradition to embrace the future. But it's, I think, yeah, people people's aspirations is, you know, it's like they come in for a job and it's like, how much money am I going to get paid? Instead of feeling like, what skill sets do you bring to the employer? You know, it's, it's those things. It's, you know, it's like there's a, I suppose they get maybe, it's like a racehorse, they get blinkers on. But the thing is, again, society allows this as well. No one, no one uh, fails. And, you know, we talk about being under pressure or, you know, being stressed. Well, you know, stress is good because, you know, you, you know, some stress makes, when I'm stressed out, if I'm going to do it, before I came and done this, I get a little bit tense. If I go and do a, a, a speech to three or 400 people or 50 people, I get tense and I, I think about it and I get worried because I get, I get nervous. And if I wasn't nervous, I'd be scared. I'd be even more, I'd be more, more uh, uh, concerned. So I think yes. being, being stressed, uh, being, being worried, and it shows you how, and, it, and that helps you dealing with situations. I yeah. believe, just my personal opinion, you can deal with a situation, you know how to handle it. <laughs> If you've always been sugar-coated with, with gloves on all of your life, you've never been exposed. It's like a bust. It's like a, it's no different than COVID. You know, sometimes you have to be exposed to a virus, to something to make it better as well. So it's just that, that. That's the big difference, I would say, now. But, you know, and the same thing is uh, the world has changed. This technology has changed, which is great. And using technology from a, a, a company perspective to make things better, more economical, uh, which is good as well. But so it's, it's a lot about, you know, as much as things have changed, they remain the same. It's all about the, the person and their, uh, their attitude. I read a book there just last year with a very famous Scotsman called um, uh, Andrew Carnegie. And it yeah. was a uh, famous, famous entrepreneur. He was the richest man in the world at one time, the, the, the early 1900s. Was it steel? He was steel. Yeah, he he came. He came from a place that I called them Fermland in Scotland. Yeah, and then went to uh, come over to America. It was, it was a whole sad story. He was running te telegrams. That's how he started working telegrams. Then he he figured out the, the, a little bit of steel, and he bought into things. And then he owned the steel mills. And at the same time, the railway road was getting built. And the whole thing. Anyway, I was reading this book, and it was like uh, it was ba the, basically the time period was like. <laughs> 1890 to maybe 1900s type thing, early 1902 or something. And he's talking about these things and, and, and he says in today's world, and I'm reading this, I'm thinking, oh, this is wrong. They, and I'm thinking, the principles are still today in today's world. That was 100 and odd years ago. Those principles are exactly the same today. Nothing has changed. No. And I was going to say, I thought, this is all misprint. They've, they've screwed this book up here. But what he was basically saying is like, in that time, in the, the late 1800s, it was exactly the same, same, same thing. And it's the same thing today in 2020. It's the same thing. It's all about people. 
It's all about attitude. Is you know using uh, people, uh, you know, use, using people to to the uh, the potential, or trying to extract the potential from themselves. Is there a dropout uh, per percentage uh, in the culinary school? That do you do you get a lot of? Pretty much. So, well, it's, it's, we don't. We actually don't keep numbers, but yeah, I would say maybe after three or four years, you you could lose fifty percent. Uh -huh. You know, it's it's a tough it's a tough business. It's it's not easy, and then there's a lot of things like you know, like uh, the food food is relatively inexpensive. You know, as in a, in a restaurant because they're squeezing the wages. You know, yeah, it's it's nice outside. The rents are more expensive. The food, I mean, just now uh, with the, the the financial climate, the food's more expensive. The the rent's expensive. The wages are expensive. The heat light heat light power, and the the sometimes the wage is not as good as it could be. So that's that's a deterrent, you know. Like after you know five, six, seven, eight, nine years, you can see yourself. Oh, I have to look for something else. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's. I was going to ask you about that, John. Is that uh, you know what people who you know are are maybe scrubbing the pots in the back or doing the serving in in any type of restaurant? And and let's narrow it down to a successful restaurant. They sell burgers and they sell a lot of them. Are the economics? Not that we'll just charge a little bit more for every burger and then pay everybody a living weight. Like, or do I have something wrong there? I, you've got me. I, I'm drinking that, John. I'm drinking that Kool Aid by the gallon. But the challenge is, is the general public don't want to pay. They, they say, yeah, you know, I want everything. You know, I gave it. This is real life situation. I want a biodegradable. I want an organic. I want this and that. But I only pay five bucks. The true cost is possibly 10 bucks, 11 bucks. But everyone wants to be sensitive to the environment. But then when it comes down to the actual dollars and cents and that money out the wallet, it's like a Scotsman, you know, like his short hands and deep pockets. Well, sometimes there's a disconnection with, you know, you have to pay. If you want to drive a, a Jaguar, you have to pay a price. If you want to drive a, a Kia Soul like myself, there's, there's a difference, right? And you can't have the same thing for, for less value. So, I think that is a big problem. Yeah, is it that much more that the consumer would go? Oh, that's a breaking point for I, me. I would say twenty five cents. I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm just giving you a ballpark number type thing. Just like get up in the air here. Yeah, uh, I would say it could be thirty percent more. Thirty percent. Yeah, thirty percent easy. That's good to know. All so right. that, that, that's but definitely it's, it's the money. And then if you go to different countries, it's you know like if you look at uh, in Sweden or uh, yeah Sweden especially. You know, they pay a lot more for food. You pay in Japan, you pay for food. But here's the thing, it's always good food. It's, you know, it's not necessarily junk food. So again, it's like, where's the balance? And, you know, the yeah. other thing is in North America, especially, we have so much food waste. You know, I think the stats are like, um, I think it's 30%, if not 35%. The food that comes out the ground goes back in the garbage because yeah. everyone's yeah. looking for that perfect, you know, that tomato that's beautiful and red. And they've seen on the television. That's what they're looking for. They don't want ugly. I call ugly, uh, ugly tomatoes. They don't want ugly carrots. That's yes. You know, but you think about it. If you take a beautiful carrot, long and slender, like Bugs Bunny would have in the movies type thing, or you know, like one of those TV shows, and they're all slim and like runway models. You're making a a, a bowl of soup. You're going to puree it. What's the difference? Yeah. If it's bulky and heavy and it's distorted and the whole thing as long as it's washed and cleaned and peeled at the end of the day it's the same thing it's just going to be as tasty but you know something where we've been programmed in that you have to buy this thing because it looks good as well so looks are you know the old saying is looks are deceiving you have to look you know it's, it's like going I mean i love i'm a big I'm, i love india and sometimes you have to see what you see if you part see this is maybe even sounds irish now i mean scottish but you have to see past what you see to see the true thing. So I think the same good. Are you are you setting up a kitchen currently in India, or was that an older article that I read? No, that was that was uh, that was uh, maybe a year or two ago before COVID, just before COVID actually. Uh, one of the things at George Brown uh, College were very uh, progressive in a lot of different ways, and you know how can we change the the environment of the education? What education has to be taught to the students of today, so they're successful today and tomorrow. So we set up a program with a partner school in the, the Punjab up in uh, Chandigarh, uh, Shikari University. Yeah. And then the students will do two years in India, and then they'll come to George Brown and do two years at George Brown for a culinary degree. 
Right. But they will get a certificate from the uh, of completion from Shikara in India and then for George Brown. But to make it a George Brown certificate, we teach the same George Brown program in India with Indian teachers. However, uh, just now there's a George Brown faculty member over in India taking some of the classes. So they'll go to India, we'll teach them exactly the same. So I know to do the same. And then a lot of the, the demonstrations are done here in Canada and are you know basically via satellite they're uh, they're uh, trans uh, transported to uh, to India to uh, uh, Shandiga. but at the same time I built a kitchen that's exactly the same as a kitchen we would have here. Now the challenge is to buy a stove. I mean the best stove to buy you're going to be buying a stove and a, and a kitchen for me is I love a big gallon flan which is a you know they're made here actually out by uh, Brampton uh, the airport here in Toronto. They, they travel all over, they sell them all over the world. I mean, beautiful, beautiful piece of machinery. This this thing is like a the old Land Rover. You know, 40 years later, it's still going to be gone. You just have to make sure you get the parts and it's like, it's not complicated either. So it's it's just a staple for any chef. So it's, you know, that we built a kitchen that's now, it's, uh, it's exactly the same. I mean, uh, the, the so that, that way when the students come to Canada and uh, to George Brown, they will be used to that equipment. And then it's the, the, the the continuity between the two and then also that the, the marking is, is, is precise uh, so that when we give the certificate the certificate of graduation it, they, they have earned it as, a, as in a GBC uh, CHCA uh, Canadian uh, certification. I, I'm curious I thought the, 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 the stove you mentioned is it gas or electric? Uh, gas you can mostly always gas but you know the other thing is gallon uh, they also make induction which is going to come down the road I mean it's you can buy these little, I don't know if you go to Costco or these places, you know, you can buy a, an induction stove, which is a, like a micro magnetic field, which is good because it doesn't, it uses energy when you're using it. But then, you know, you can, you can switch it off like in two seconds, it's gone, it's cold again. You can build, buy, build a boiler pot of water in about 30 seconds, whereas it would take a long time in a pot with gas or other electricity. So it's just using, again, like I said earlier on, it's, you know, the things that have changed you know, uh, in our profession uh, from teaching is that there's so much technology that has changed the, the way we do things. I have a couple questions just about the, the craft of cooking itself, John. I was curious, how many times do you have to make a complicated meal before you get it right? Okay, Paul, honestly, don't make it complicated. Oh, <laughs> You know, I, I was just doing, I, I did an article on CBC the other week there, and it was like, you know, what happens is, is you have to cook to your skill sets. You know, it's like, like hitting a golf ball. If you slice from the tee, don't use a driver. Use something you're going to hit the ball straight with. And the same, like, if you're going to, like, say if tonight, Paul, you're going to have some friends coming over for dinner. And Paul wants to do something complicated and fancy and has never done it before. Well, trust me, it's going to be a flopping failure. It's going to be yeah. a disaster. <laughs> so the KISS method, keep it simple, silly. Right. Quick, right. stupid thing. But anyway, yeah, keep it right. simple. Do Thank something you. you've done before. And if you've done a meatloaf before, do a meatloaf and just knock it out of the pot. Because the more you do something, you get more you, you, you become more you must masterful of making that thing. And then if you're going to be making something, it's going to be complicated, like you'd like to do, because everyone wants to do something different. And I do say, I'm the worst sometimes. My wife marks me on my food. And I've had a few uh, fails that she just says, no, forget it, buddy. That's not good enough. And I mark her stuff as well, right? Uh, and sometimes I've had 11 out of 10s, but not too many, not very few. 11 out of 10 is once in a while. But and you're still married. They're still married, yeah. <laughs> But the thing is, again, is, is, is to do those things, Paul, is to do them in small increments. So, for instance, if you want to do some sort of fancy sauce, practice it. Do it once, do it twice, do it three times. If you're going to do a sort of fancy potato or something complicated, do, do the potato and do, do it in small stages. So you build this, uh, the repertoire up. It's like that, that, if you're going to dance, set one, set two, set three, set four. So do it in small parts and then think about it logically. I want the food. I want to sit down with my guests. I want to enjoy the food. I want to eat with them. I want to talk to them. So how are you going to do that? So for instance, rather than making a, uh, I don't know if that was, uh, I done a demonstration a while ago and it was a, 
to try to cook something for two dollars. And it's, it's possible. You can make a great meal for two dollars a person. And I got I went to a, a shopper's drug mat and I got these chicken thighs, bone one out, just take the bone out, put it in a pan, salt, pepper, a little bit of herbs, nothing fancy. And then the, the salad I served with it was a, a beetroot and orange salad. So you can buy beets that are already cooked in a vacuum pack at some of the, a lot of the supermarkets. Took the beet, sliced the beet, a little bit of vinegar, a little bit of maple syrup or honey, spice it up a little bit of a sauce. Take the, took the, the orange, took the pith off, cut it into squares. You can make fancy, fancy shapes, sides, doesn't make any difference. A little bit of oil and vinegar, toss them together, cook the chicken, the chicken on the plate, that over the top, sensational. Simple. So Sounds food great. doesn't have to be complicated. We make, we make it more complicated because we watch too much Food Network. In a fancy restaurant uh, where people are choosing wines, uh, are, are those are recommendations, let's say the, the customer doesn't know what wine they want. Uh, are those are, are the wine choices going to be made by the head chef, or are they going to be made by a sommelier? What if you don't have a sommelier there? I, I would say they'd be there. I mean, most places, the uh, I mean, you're going to make money when you sell wine, so you want to make sure you have a wine that, that fits the budget type thing of the person. Right. And I think the thing is about this, you know, you're going to have a piece of fish. Do you have to have a, a white wine? And is, it, is it a riesling which will go with Evan or a Chardonnay? But you could have a, I mean, you've got a piece of salmon, you could have a Pinot Noir, or you could have a Beaujolais type thing. So I think is, and everyone, not everyone likes the same wines. And I, I'm, I'm a great believer. I mean, if you like to try and try wines, which is good, uh, you know, and, and, and try something different. And it's not always about where it comes from. It's not always about the vineyard, where it comes from. It's not always about the price. Uh, it's no different than the three of us. And we say, okay, guys, we're going to have a we're going to we're going to go for with our wife for a coffee. Now, Paul, you you may have a black coffee. I may have a, a, a coffee with milk, and John may have a cappuccino. Or the wife may have a a frappy lappy grande soya whatever it's going to be, and it's all coffee. But if, again, as everyone's got different flavors, and and I, when I when I stayed with in Bordeaux, and we had the the the, the, the with the, the Chateau Mouton. They must have opened nine wines for me. Beautiful wines, really good stuff. And then the the gentleman who was pouring them. So we tasted. We you know we we done we went through the whole rigmarole for wines and we smelt, taste the whole thing. And I says I don't like that one. He says, but that is a you know nineteen whatever it's going to be blah blah blah. And I says yeah I don't like it. And he couldn't figure that out. <laughs> if we all like the same wines, we'd only be drinking the same wines. And that's right. a good thing. The great thing about wine is to try, you know, if you're going to go to a restaurant, try and see something, you know, try them at home. Uh, and, and I mean, I love finding uh, a wine for under $20 or even $10. And that's, you know, it's good because I remember, uh, you know, we used to do tastings when I was at the King Edward Hotel in Toronto. And what we used to do is take the bottle and put aluminum foil. I mean, this is a good thing for your, for your, uh, your audience. Get your bottle. So actually, I got a bottle of right in front of me here. Not I'm drinking on duty here, right? But uh, I got a bottle here, right? And this is, uh, it's called Nightshade, which is all, it's non-alcoholic. But look, a beautiful bottle, the whole thing. And sometimes you look at the bottle, well, that's going to be expensive. It's going to be this and that. Anyway, what we would do, we would get the bottle and cover the bottle with aluminum foil. Open it up. And then, you know, I've, I've done this at home. And we have four wines or five wines and we pour all the wines. And only I know what the wine is, and only I know how much it costs. And you get your guests to find out what wine did you like? Is it wine A, wine B, wine C, or wine D? And we talk about it, and you maybe have a piece of cheese or something else. And then after you add the totals up, and then you say, okay, what was the what was wine one? And sometimes it's sometimes it's always, I wouldn't say always, but it's the the, the least expensive wine. Hmm. So sometimes it's, it's that. So I think it's, and then once you find a wine that you like, uh, uh, Paul, so say for lunch, you like a Pinot Noir. So if you go to a restaurant and have a Pinot Noir or try something different, I mean, unless you get deep pockets, I don't spend a lot of money trying something I've never, I don't know what the grape is like, but that's a good thing about trying wines, you know, like are you go and you get, but then if you had a sommelier in the, the restaurant, you could tell her or him, you know, what you like and what you don't like and they could advise you. Right. I mean, for instance, uh, I go back to Alan Ducasse. 
He was interviewing for a sommelier at the Dorchester Hotel in London, which is one of the top hotels in the UK. And I says, so chef, I says, wow, that must be great, you know, to, to be the sommelier at the Dorchester. I says, how did, what's the, the process? And he was, he's involved in it and he chose them. We give him a fancy, fancy meal. So they're going to have like one of us, like drop your dead socks off, FaceTime Michelin meals. And he only gives them 90 euros for the wine for the whole meal. So they have to be economical. So they have to know their wines. So they, can you have a fancy menu and can you pair up less expensive wines? Right. I wouldn't say cheap wines, but less expensive. And that's that's a talent. That's a talent. That you have to do. So it's that that's the thing is again, is like when you go to the restaurant, get something you like so you're not disappointed. Yeah. But I remember uh, my uh, my grandmother uh, uh, Christmas time. We were all sitting around. Well, they were sitting around, not me. We would we can do it. We were like kids at the time. Uh, they used to have a bottle of wine. And it was a bottle of Sautern. And I always remember the bottle, the label, and the whole thing of Sautern, which is more a dessert wine. But they were sitting down with turkey. When I think about it now, I laugh. They were sitting down with Christmas dinner, the turkey, and eating, drinking Sautern wine. That's the last wine I drink with a thing. But it's not about that. It's about they, they enjoyed the wine. Everyone liked the wine. And that's what it's about. It's about sharing. It's about being, you know, like break, uh, breaking bread with people if everyone just sat around right. the table and had you know some food broke some bread the world would be a better place i believe perhaps the most memorable meal that i've ever had uh, was in somebody's home and uh, uh they were they were from france and they really enjoyed wine and uh um It, it, it was like outside of what you were saying about just differences in palate overall for this meal for every course there was a different wine selected for me i don't get and uh outside of the fact that i was blasted by the end of the, the meal i really could start to appreciate the nuance with cheese versus yes. this and as i say the most memorable meal of my life yeah, it's just, and I think I think it, what it is is once you once you you you, you the opportunity, uh, John, to try that cheese. I mean, it's like no, an easy one would be port. Port and cheese go so well together, especially you know, you have like a Stilton. It's like there was a good, it's a yin and a yang. There's a good balance. Uh, it's like a seesaw. It's like how do you get them together that they're different, but at the same time. And I think the more you 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 try and engage with the different wines or wines from different parts of the world, whether it's an old uh, uh, wine from the old world or from the new world. As you get an appreciation and then it's just like you know you build up a repertoire of flavors in your your head it's not different than if i'm going to create a dish uh for dinner tonight with my wife i go to the supermarket this afternoon and i see chicken and i see oranges and i see something else i'm like so i imagine my my palate how's this going to taste together and it's yeah. not different than that and buying a bottle of wine how does the bottle of wine taste it's a bourgeois it's going to it's going to have a you know nice fruity up up front it's not going to be heavy in alcohol what is even a Bordeaux or a Tempanillo? They're going to be big and bold and 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 you know not yeah you know, strong for maybe strong cherry flavors type thing. So it's it's just balance at the end of the day. It's not different than you know uh, water. You know, do you want Perrier water or a, or, a, or, a, or a, another sort of a mineral water? Or do you just want tap water. It's the same thing, but it's yeah. just there's they're just emphasizing more different things that they are in this. You know, it's just that, but it's, I think the most important thing is to try and uh, see what you like. And if not everyone's going to like the same thing, which is good. In your own career, John, as you grew more successful and developed a reputation, at, at what point did people start calling you? You know, the, the, I'm going to say this on this totally ridiculous, which is uh, I would say I'm really successful. I just, I'm fortunate, you know, I'm really fortunate. It's just, I love what I do. It's been a hobby and I've been, you know, it's been there, but you know, people will ask me to go and do, I mean, I go into, I was just in Newfoundland uh, three weeks ago doing an event I've done for the last seven, eight years. Uh, people ask you to go different things, but it's just, it's, you know, and it's, it's, just, it's, you know, I hate to say it, it's just having fun, but you know, yeah, I mean, it says once you, I mean, people, I mean, the one thing I must admit that was in my career, which helped me along with working at Buckingham Palace, but, you know, as uh, you know, people say, what was the food like? The food was simple. It was just good food, produced really, really well, and, and good quality food. So I learned a lot, not necessarily about fancy. I mean, it was fancy food to a certain degree, but it was just taking something simple and, and, and showing the food some tender, loving care and respect. 
and thinking where it came from. It would really give you a sort of a, uh, an overall uh, uh, sort of holistic approach of food and, and how it should taste rather than putting a lot of different flavors. So I learned that there. But, you know, people are very respectful for that. And I, I mean, I've been to I've been to Brazil, to Sao Paulo, to the Mesa Sao Paulo, uh, present with some of the top chefs in the world. In Massimo Tura, we were there. We went to uh, the a sort of soup kitchen they done. I mean, they made they done a book of it. Uh, uh, I mean, I've cooked at so many different places. The Scottish Chefs Conference was was great. Uh, I've been to Italy uh, doing uh, uh, stuff there. I've been to all over India. I love India, mm-hmm. uh, Singapore, and uh, so it's been good. But I mean, I'm very humbled that people ask me to come and do it. And and I think that what I try to do is that, you know, it's. Uh, if I can do it, somebody else can do it. But it's, it's thinking of the audience you're going to be there. As a professional chef, so I'm maybe, maybe maybe make something that's much more complicated. But when I do it, I want to make sure there's some funny elements as well. It's not just like blah, 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 blah. I mean, that's like I, I can stay at home and you know watch that. I want to, I want someone to entertain me. I want I want to have a laugh. I want them to make you know fun about something or, or tell me a story. Tell me a story. Or, you know, it's like uh, you know, you, you ask me about India. So I could tell you about going to the, the market, the Subsi Mundi in the morning, and it's not the most pretty place in the whole world, but it's the smells, it's the taste, it's the people, and getting this food together and then how you cook it. Uh, so food's more than just, um, I mean, it sounds crazy, food's more than just food. Food is it's a, it's a vehicle for me to transport and bring things together and to have fun, and, you know, it's just a living and it helps me. But, you know, it's, yeah, I'm very, very... Uh, uh, very appreciative that people you know take you places and uh, they're very they're very kind to you. You speak of kindness, and that brings. To, I remember an anecdote that you you related in an, in an interview early in your career. You were chopping parsley, and you basically cut your hand to the bone. Had to yeah. go to the hospital. But when you got back, the head chef, whatever, said, "Suck it up, Buttercups. Keep chopping." So in in the uh, in the uh, um, the industry there is a an aura that there's an adversarial relationship between the chef and the staff where they uh, they can be quite um unkind is that just entertainment value or is that the culture in kitchens um well, that's, that's changed that, that's a bit john you've done some good research i'm very impressed <laughs> uh very good stuff like the yeah, that, that was that was at Central Town, Glasgow. I'd cut my finger, the top of this finger off here. Blood was all over the place. I went to the Royal Infirmary in Glasgow, come back. Okay, Higgins, cut the rest of the parcel and don't cut your bloody hand. The other hand, you need it done today. And he just left the blood, the whole thing. It was there. I had to go back and clean it up. And that, that was it, right? So it's, you learn it. I mean, it's not for everyone, right? But the kitchens are like that. Forget it. So you have to change your change your your attitude type thing. Uh, whereas today it would be different. But I mean, many times when I was at Buckingham Palace, I was using a slicing machine. You know, you can imagine a slicing machine revolving fast, and I took the top of this finger off, and there was blood all over the place. And I says to the, the sous chef, Johnny Woods at the time, I says, Johnny, says someone's cut themselves. Hurricane, and he's called me Hurricane Higgins. Hurricane, it's only me and you in the bloody kitchen. So it's either you or me, and it's you. And then I seen the blood in the thing, my finger, and I'm like, oh, God, because I didn't feel it because it was the thing was so sharp. I went to the chef's office and uh, I fainted. I seen the stars were like a, a cartoon, you know, when you see the, the Bugs Bunny or that. It gets hot yes. and that thing. It's like, I felt like, holy smokes. And then they sent me to the wrong muse, which they looked after the horses and that at Buckingham Palace. And the nurse got a hold of me there. I and mean, she was like a bruiser. And I think, oh, the f- I should have just let, them, let it bleed or put some, of, you know, some sticky tape over it because she was brutal. And then we should put, she sewed it back on again, which was good, thank God. But yeah, I mean, it's, there's not love, there wasn't a lot of that empathy then, but I think today there's much more of a friendliness or a cohesive ah. working relationship with each other. Uh, because, you know, some it's not because you have to be nice, but I just feel as if it's it's a much more pleasant uh, ambience. I mean, yesterday I was in a place called Stock here uh, in Toronto, up at Young and Eglinton. It's a new concept that's been opened. It's like a food store plus two or three restaurants in one building. And I, I was met the I know the chef Jackie Moore very well there. But he's not always there, and they have a sort of takeout. And I love getting past it. It just excites me when I see all these cooks and they're all smiling, they're happy, and they're joking, and I, and I think 
And I said to Jack, Jack Mullis uh, last night, uh, John, and he says, hi, how are you doing? I says, good, good, good. And I says, well, you know, from Jack, I said, I love coming here and sitting here and have a coffee. I go for an Americano with milk. And then, I, and it's usually I sit outside, but the weather's terrible. So I'm sitting inside, there's just a lot of space. And I look at all the cooks. They're all happy. That makes me happy. And I said to Jack Mullis last night, happy kitchen, happy chefs, happy chefs, good food. And if it's not the other way, no one cares. So they all care about the food and there's like a, a cohesive team together. It's, it's no different, you know, on a soccer team or a hockey team or, a, you know, I support a team in Glasgow called Glasgow Celtic. And two years ago, I mean, a year and a half ago, two, yeah, a year and a half ago, they were pathetic. There, were, there was no team spirit, the whole thing. The thing had gone to, I could coin an old phrase my granny used to say, it's gone to hell bag. They were just pathetic. And they were just terrible. And then they hired this guy from Australia, a guy called Ange Postacoglu, that no one in Scotland had heard, no one in the UK had heard. And they're saying that he's an Australian. Why the hell in hell did they ever hire an Australian? This guy's going to be useless. They won't last in the whole thing. Anyway, for the first couple of games, it was tough. But he had this vision. And he set, he set the place and the whole thing. Now they went and they won the, the within the first year, they won the league championships. I mean, Toronto, Toronto, uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, They've been trying for 40 years to win the Stanley Cup. They also win the League Cup. They win the Scottish Cup, the whole thing, the first year. So it's, again, it's about, it's about attitude and getting good people to do it and, and people being happy. And I look at the players from a year and a half ago to now. They're all smiling. Like, someone scored a goal yesterday. They were playing against Motherwell. And they were all smiling. They were happy, the whole thing. But, you know, that that comes from within. And that's 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 leadership. That's been being a manager. Being a manager is not always just about doing the fancy thing is about, you know, making everyone feel they're important. It's just like a, it's like a jigsaw. There's a piece and there's so many pieces that have to be put together. And to be a good manager, you have to put all those pieces together to make it sing. And, and you know, it's, it's like a, it's like an album. You know, you, you press that button and everyone's on the same tune. And it's like, you listen to the, the opera, you listen to Vivaldi and it's good. It's good. You know, when it's good, it's, it's good. It's not by accident. Yeah, yeah, it's not by accident. That, that, that it takes time and effort. It's the characteristics of an individual that, that she or he can can bring someone together. So that's what the new manager of uh, Glasgow Celtic has done. He's brought the team together like there's not tomorrow. There's no ego. Everyone's in the same boat. And you he still says, have uh, um, Hamish, your West Highland here? Yeah, and Hamish, yeah. They're downstairs sleeping. That's why I have to run in about 10 minutes' time. Uh, okay. Hamish has got Addison's disease, which is a human disease. Yes. And he has to be, uh, he has to get a pill. So I have to make sure he gets a pill, but I look after my dogs uh, like there's no tomorrow. And I keep on saying to the two of them, I get Jock and Hamish. And I keep on saying, you guys get better treated than the flipping Royal Corgis. You get better food in them. And That's I, what I was going to ask you. What is, do you feed commercial or do you uh, um, make their food? They, they get some They get some, uh, some kibble type thing, it's, which is a good kibble. There's not full of, you know, filler, as I call it. Right. But I mean, I, I don't, I, I mean, this is, this is nuts. This is, I mean, it's funny, I don't know if, uh, I'll tell you two things here, uh, uh, guys. When I was at Buckingham Palace, everyone said, did the Queen ever send you anything back? And I said, yeah, once. What was it? The dog food. The way I'd done the food for the corgis was not the way, they used to dice it up small, and whatever. <laughs> I put it through a meat grinder, so I got that sent back, and so that's the only meal I get sent back to me. So the dog, right? I mean, last night, and this is a bit money, right? So they kind of to meat with a lot of protein so they can't have beef just now and, and chicken type thing so they have to have uh, one of the, the the meats they can eat is lamb so i, I looked I, I got a couple of little lamb chops and you know i, I buy different things from them. i buy them when it's inexpensive or something on sale so i thought yesterday i, I this like i bought a lamb chop this was just for me for, for a moment so i bought this little lamb chop and it was like seven dollars then i weighed the lamb chop i cooked the lamb chop and i took all the waste like there was a little piece of bone so I'm going to do a costing in the lamb chop today to see the actual yield for the lamb chop. And then I bought, because we're going to have it on uh, Sunday uh, for my wife or some friends come over. I bought a, a sort of, a, I went to Costco and I got a leg of lamb. So I took the leg of lamb. I'm going to take the leg of lamb on Sunday. I'm going to weigh the leg of lamb. I'm going to season it. I'm going to cook it. And then I'm going to think of the shrink factor of what was lost. I'm going to weigh it again to see how much it yields. Because sometimes what happens is you're better off buying a leg of lamb or a lamb chop. And I'm not saying they get leg of lamb all the time, but it's just to see what's the best <laughs> because I'm always looking for simple, easy ways to feed these guys. But yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll cook, uh, 
I cook. If you came for dinner tonight, but Paul, you were saying about doing a fancy meal, it's complicated. I put as much care and attention into cooking for my dogs as I would do for you or, jo uh, you or John coming to dinner tonight. That's just the way it is, right? I want to cook rice. I want to make sure it's nice. Don't ask me why. It's just my DNA. Uh, that it's it's important to me. It's important to them. Healthy, healthy food for the dog. Healthy dogs. Very simple. And they give me so much fun. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Uh, in my line of work, the way I earn my living, John, is I do work with dogs uh, from a behavior perspective. But I do run into clients sometimes who do make their dogs food, but uh, which used to be more of a problem. But there's a lot more resources available to do it right. But you know, you, you'd be across from somebody who you knew clearly was not feeding themselves correctly, that were yeah. now working with another species and mm -hmm. winging okay. it, and that's not good either. But uh, yeah, I think it's just like with human I mean, beings. I mean, for things I feed I me mean, feed them the. Uh, like, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm just making a point with it. They don't lay a lamb all the time. Trust me. I was just sort of seeing what's more. You know, like if you look at you know you, you look at Caesar. So what I'll do after that, I'll look at Caesar's dog food, right? For instance, Caesar's dog food maybe, maybe costs you three dollars for a portion. You weigh the portion. How much is in the, the portion of uh, Caesar's dog food via cooking good lamb? So what right. are you going to sell them, right? So it's, it's that that's where but I feed them like uh, cheap things, like sardines, you know, sardines and and water. They love them. Yes. So again, it's you know it's simple things like that. It's good for them. It's healthy. It's good. omega three. The whole thing. So it's it's not about just. I mean, I would never cook them filling. I mean, I mean, I've had people. I've been to guests. Oh, house, I agree. Yes. Yeah, and they're cooking. The, they're cooking the dog filling. I mean, it's the flipping worst thing you can give anyone. Yeah. I mean, give me a piece of beef chai, beef beef cheek or. Give me a piece of oxtail and give them something that's tasty. But, you know, yeah. again, they think because they're giving the dog something expensive that it's good. And trust me, it doesn't taste well. And it's just like, it's okay, it's fine. What would you rather have? A nice beef, meaty Hungarian stew at a Philly mean young. I know what I'm going to have. One question that I wanted to ask, uh, is there such a thing as Canadian cuisine? Oh, for sure there's Canadian cuisine. Canadian cuisine... Uh, when I came to Canada, no one really, it was hard to define what Canadian cuisine is. There's a lot of things that are scattered through from east to west uh, that, you know, different people, like for here in, in Ontario, there's uh, black walnuts, which are, are here and they're good, healthy uh, food. I mean, you get maple syrup, as we all know, you get wild rice, but, you know, there, there's fish in different lakes, there, there's game, there's berries, there's a magnitude of different things. And there's a lot of great young chefs and chefs that are out there, uh, even my age, uh, that I've really honed in. I mean, there's a, if anyone has a, an opportunity to go out to try a, a regional cuisine and, and Canadian cuisine, I think uh, there's a place in St. Andrews, uh, New Brunswick, uh, the Ross Mountain Inn. Phenomenal. Everything's local, uh, which is tasty. I mean, there's, there's uh, places out in, in, in BC, there, there's um, Ned Bell. There's so many different places that are doing local stuff. So it's, it's redefining it. And people say, well, it's not really Canadian. It's a little bit of a, you know, it's, it's Asian. Yeah, but it's something, you know, it's, the great thing about living in Canada, multiculturalism, you can take, you can cook. I can cook fish and chips, but I can cook it like a tempura Japanese style. It doesn't right. have to be the way it is. So I think that's a lot of what I see Canadian cuisine is taking and the, the ethnic diversity, the ethnic food from a, a country and changing it to here. So there's no reason why you couldn't do a game, uh, you know, using game meat and do a, a curry. You know, it's just... It's just matching things up that, that are good, that, that, that are tasty, they're plentiful. And, and they're there, you know, it's like taking, uh, you could take bear meat and you can make a Cornish pasty. You know, so it's, it's things like that. And I think that's the great thing of being in Canada. And it's like, you know, people say, well, it's maple syrup, it's wild rice. Well, that's a bit, you know, how many times you're going to eat maple syrup? It's a bit too much, but there's, there's great regional, uh, regional food from all across the country. I mean, uh, I mean, other places that do a good job is like even the, the Bam Springs Hotel. I mean, they, they really promote uh, uh, Canadian cuisine, small restaurants, motels. It's just, it's right across the country, there's some great stuff that's definitely regional. Uh, sometimes it's, it's nice to try things from away as well, right? But at the same thing, sometimes you have to experience what's in your back door. Uh, I mean, some great cheeses here. And sometimes people call them artisanal cheeses. And they're terrible. So you just don't buy them again. Well, it's been very informative, John. Uh, we really appreciate your time. 
I, I would like to mention that the uh, George Brown College has a scholarship in your name. We'll put a link to that up there in case anybody wants to donate. Please, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's one of the things I'm very, very, very proud of. Uh, they're doing an, an award of excellence on my name. And all the money goes to the students, uh, which is great. And that's, that's, that makes me so excited that, you know, like after 21 years, they're actually doing this for me and they're doing a, you know, a reception and a dinner type thing to raise money for it. And, uh, you know, the more we can help the, the students of today, we're going to have better food services. And I don't care whether they're a three-star Michelin restaurant or at a roadhouse or at a poutine truck, as long as they have the skill sets to be successful and they, they can work healthily, hel uh, they work with uh, some hygiene uh, and sanitation yeah. regulations because it's, uh, it's important as well. So it's just not about the food on the plate, it's about all the things, how the food got to the plate. So. Yeah, if you could put that up, I'd be to totally appreciate uh, that as well. And uh, like I say, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, yeah, so I've got just a different opinion on food and, and what I do, but I love what I do. It's been fun. It's got me around the world. Yeah, your passion shines through. It's been very informative. I've, I've learned stuff that I had just had no idea about. And do, really do appreciate your time. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Appreciate it. Thank you.